This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics, dare to sound different. It was actually Michael Jackson. Well, then that because of a guitar, uh, an English teacher at school. So we had this, I was, I was six or seven, and uh, we had this English teacher whose name was, was Mr. Peters, and he had a Green Morgan as a vehicle, and, we, and he played the guitar. And for us to learn English, he would once a week, he play us a song. It was usually Yellow Submarine or something like this. And, and I went home and I said to him, I told my mother I wanted to, to, to play music and stuff. And she went and bought me Michael Jackson Bad on the back of that. And I heard it and I was like, wow, this is incredible. It was the first thing I ever heard, really, except some, you know, supermarket music, whatever. It's the first thing I listened to. And, uh, and, and then I told my mother I wanted to be Michael Jackson. And she said that wasn't possible, but I could start with maybe guitar lessons and, and see where it takes me. And that's how I fell in love with music. With Mr. Peters in school, I hope I hope one, he sees this. I don't know if he's still around. <laughs> it was a uh, time ago, but uh, that's how it started. And you know, you talked there about wanting to become Michael Jackson. So was it quite early on that you wanted to do this professionally? Did you ever envisage your life doing anything else professionally? So uh, when I wanted to be Michael Jackson, I realized it was. It was not possible. My mother told me it wasn't possible. I decided that I was, I know I never thought of it as a career. And I, you know, you're a kid and you go from wanting to be a truck driver because you saw a truck driver that looked powerful to being a superhero or a, a Schwarzenegger or a Stallone of some kind. And then eventually I landed on the fact that I wanted to be a lawyer. So I went to, from Italy, I went to Nice and I did the law, uh, I studied law, law university. And to fund it, I played in the streets. I was a busker and that's how, uh, and I never thought of it as this is my career. I was just making some bucks <laughs> to, to pay for the rent and, and, and the food. And universities are not expensive in France. It costed me the equivalent of 300 pounds, let's say, or, or $400 or 278 euros. Uh, year. And, and so in terms of um, the Gypsy Queen starting, um, mm -hmm. did, did it evolve from there? You know, um, you talked about busking quite a lot in Nice. I mean, when, when did you think of forming the Gypsy Queens or, or was there, uh, you know, quite a long time between university and forming the Gypsy Queens? So the Gypsy Queens was a bunch of buskers that, that got together to to play uh so i founded it with with phil jones who is still a very good friend of mine he was uh, already a busker when i got there and he was very good and i wanted to play with him so we started playing together and then all these other musicians street musicians joined because we were doing quite well financially and somehow people realized that and that's how it basically the gypsy queens was a bunch of buskers that got together and phil decided he was the boss <laughs> that we would go to Rome and busk in Rome. So these seven musicians went to Rome and we thought it was going to be a catastrophe because there were so many of us and, you know, sharing the, the, the money was going to be bad, not, not good enough. It turned out it was the best ever. And we ended up going to, to this restaurant uh, in Rome that was very expensive. And that's how we got the name, which is another story altogether. And that's basically how it started. What, what was the restaurant in Rome? It was called Galleria del Bramante. It doesn't exist anymore now. It's, oh, uh, it's a shame. Excuse the I, term. I enjoy a Ponzi restaurant or two, so it's a shame it doesn't uh, exist. Are you in Rome right now? No, I'm in Mexico at the moment. All right. I am in uh, Saint Bart. All right. Beautiful. So we're, Beautiful. We're, yeah, we're closer. I'm thinking I'm calling England, and, <laughs> and there you are. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to be in Mexico April 11th, actually. Oh, wow. Where, whereabouts are you going? Cabo San Lucas. We have a performance there if it if it if it, if it goes ahead. Right. Nice. So so you performed in Rome at this restaurant, and 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 what what did this lead to? 
it led us to getting the name the Gypsy Queens because it was a gay restaurant, or rather, it was owned by a notorious gay figure of the nightlife of Rome. And by the third night, he invited us for dinner instead of playing, and we were a bit, you know, scared that he was expecting us to return the money we had made in front of his restaurant. And not at all. He was just inviting us for dinner, and we we then played inside. And you know, after we had dinner, and everybody went crazy. And that's when he said, uh, you guys remind me of the Gypsy Kings, but this is a gay restaurant. So if you ever want to play here again, you got to call yourselves the Gypsy Queens. So that's how we got the name. <laughs> wow. Okay. And, and so did you, did you deliberately kind of target uh, a restaurant that you knew had quite an illustrious reputation? Or was that? Oh, no, not at all. It was random. It was completely it was random. random. We would just go and see places and we, we saw this and we thought it looked good. So we thought, let's play here. And the first night was wonderful. Second night was wonderful. Third night, he said, stop tonight. You're having dinner here. You're not playing. And we are like, uh, you know, we don't do this really just for fun. This is how we live. And we can't just spend money in your beautiful, expensive restaurant. And he said, we'd have to pay. Sit down and eat and then we'll see. And then we played and then this is the story. And, and in terms of uh, how you guys prepare uh, at this stage, how did you decide on your repertoire? And uh, did you spend a lot of time rehearsing like at home or in a rehearsal room? Or did you tend to just go out and do it all together and learn on the job? So nowadays I try to be a little more professionally, if you allow me the term, but back then it was just, you know that song? No, it's a C, G and E, all right. Cool, let's do it. And then we would make mistakes and learn on the job. Since the Gypsy Queens evolved from busking to being signed to Universal and therefore having a lot of, you know, very private, very high-end clients, and then just even just for anyone, we should be a little better. So nowadays, there, I, I developed sort of a method of, of training people where you really study the repertoire, you really study every detail of it, and you, you have to know it so well that you forget it so you can then perform it which I think is how everything should be done, actually. Uh, I, I profoundly dislike, and we couldn't do that, but I profoundly dislike performers who sit with a mic stand and then there is an iPad in front of them or mm -hmm. a telephone or a computer and, and, and with the lyrics and maybe even the chords. I think that's, I mean, you go to a theater and see the, the actors pull out the script and no. So so now, now the method is you really have to know the repertoire. You show up at a rehearsal, we go over the song to make sure that every harmony is good, every, everybody's playing the same rhythm, it swings the same chords, and then we perform it. In other words, you forget all the lyrics, you forget what you're supposed to sing because you know it so well, it's just going to come out automatically, and you deliver, you give the song, the, perform the, the performance to your public. In rehearsal, obviously, there is no public, but the idea is you project yourself in front of someone and you have to charm them and make them fall in love with you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if anybody wanted a guide to how to practice something for live performance, there it is. I mean, I could not agree more with your point on iPads. I mean, music stands are even are even worse in a way, but iPads are more prevalent now because everybody thinks, oh, it's so subtle, it's so tasteful. Uh, I think it really gives away the fact that you haven't been bothered to do your preparation exactly. and immediately exactly. knocks you out as less professional. Absolutely. No homework whatsoever. Give me the money. Listen to me. But I'm not doing anything at home. No. So I only ever perform uh, what I know. Uh, and if I don't know, but I still want to please someone, I'll know part of it. I try to guess it, but then I maybe go and learn and, and learn the song. But no, I never do. And I only <laughs> I only ever played one song with a capo. Because, I, <laughs> you know, I think you, you should be able to play positions. And play the inversions. And then you move that with a capo along the neck. So yeah. I like, uh, you know, I like, I like. Maybe I'm at all a bit old-fashioned, but I like. The guitar didn't come with a capo in the beginning, so there must be a way to play it without it. Yeah, I, I understand can. using a capo for the the sound of it. Yes, but because you don't can't be bothered to learn the chords, no. Yeah, is it, is, so is it a question of learning the right inversions? If you don't use a capo, you've just got to learn all the right inversions. You've just got to spend a bit more time on it, right? Yeah, well, yeah, it goes back to what you were saying before. You you learn the scales, you, you learn the positions, and I still have a lot to learn myself, a lot to learn. Uh, and you and you just go ahead and do it. And it's a matter of how much time you want to invest in it. And, you know, some chords are way prettier played without a capo, and some chords are way 
prettier with a capo, but that's then a sonority choice. Yeah. It's not, uh, you're not locked into, oh, I don't know that chord, I'll just put a capo on and, and play play the same thing just down the neck. So it's, be- I mean, it's better to have the, uh, better to have the option for sure. Uh, yeah. Better to put and then the make effort. it a choice. And how did you guys end up getting signed to, to Universal Music and, you know, actually re- releasing some studio albums and, uh, and you know, including um, getting quite significant commercial success? I mean, the self-titled album, The Gypsy Queens, hit the top 50 in the album charts. You know, this is a huge thing to do uh, when you're talking about um, coming from busking um, outside right. on the streets. Because so I'm sure some people go outside busking on the streets and they think, you know, next stop, I'm going to be in Wembley Stadium. But, you know, how often does that happen? So to actually sure. get signed by Universal, and I mean, that shows how, how high quality your performances were. I, well, thank you. That's, that's a beautiful compliment. I think it was uh, maybe a little more inclined towards a business formula that I had developed. So we got signed because uh, the, the story is quite interesting, in my opinion. We used to play a lot in the south of France. The band started having some success, so we started playing outside of the south of France. Maybe it was Europe. Then it continued to have success, and it became New York, Hong Kong, Latin America, Africa. We started going everywhere. And our client base in the south of France, I met a few who who thought the band has stopped performing because they would never see us anymore. So I met a a client of ours. When I say client, I mean either somebody that we would see in a restaurant either somebody who would hire us privately to go and play in his house or whatever, on his boat, whatever. So I met him and he was like, oh, hi, Didi. Uh, I realized, uh, you know, too bad the the band doesn't exist anymore. I said, oh, no, what what do you mean it doesn't exist? Well, we don't see you anymore. And I realized, wow, nobody's seeing us anymore here. How do I maintain a local clientele, which is, you know, home base? So a lot of our clients are very wealthy and they have private jets, and they either try to travel with their private jets or with EasyJet. Go figure why. Or at least back then it was like that. So I thought, well, let's, I, I, I'll buy a page in the EasyJet magazine. So I bought a page in the EasyJet magazine and I asked them if they would do an advertorial. In other words, a paid article about the band. And they said yes. And we put it out there. And the first person who read it was Nick Raphael, who had moved from Sony, or I suppose he was you have to say Sony BMG, to Universal uh, London Records. When that happened, he just on a weekend, he went to Spain for a wedding and he opened the EasyJet magazine and saw our little article that talked about the band and how we used to play and where we used to play. Turns out that two years before, he had seen us play at La Petite Maison, which is the restaurant that really launched us into another sphere in Nice, which is a quite expensive, you know, beautiful restaurant. I love it. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah. Ah, I, I think it's great. The food there is amazing. Yeah, yeah. So it turns out that he had gone there for a quiet romantic dinner with his adorable wife, who is, uh, they're both friends to me, of mine today. Uh, and the quiet dinner turns out that the Gypsy Queen stormed in. And by the second song, his wife was on the chair dancing. Bono <laughs> walks in, sings a song with us. And he was like, who are these guys who come in you know, in five minutes, the whole place has gone crazy. Bono walks in, sings a song with them, and they just leave and goodbye. Turns out that he had seen us two years before reading that article and said, these are the guys I've seen at La Petite Maison. I need, that's going to be my first signing at London Records. So I think the second one was uh, Sam Smith. <laughs> wow. That's so that's, that's how we incredible. got signed. And I think that by then, the fact that we got signed was like, maybe a bit more inclined towards the story that, that you know, we were buskers and now we're going to do these studio albums, as you say. They charted, actually the same album was also number one on Amazon, which I think wow. is incredible, considering that nobody has ever heard of us really before. Uh, and, and, you know, we had a great producer in LA, Larry Klein, who, with whom I'm working now on, on the new stuff. Um, and, and that was all, you know, it was, it's what, it's what every, everyone who ever did music hoped for, maybe except me at this point because i had been friends with superstars like elton john and bono and, and and many others and i realized that that lifestyle is really something that you have to be prepared for because if you ever become famous you don't go back to not being famous it's not like today i am Didi of the gypsy queens and the gypsy queens are not known 
And tomorrow I decide to be an architect. Well, I'll have the credibility of somebody who studied architecture and went to do an architect. Or I was an architect and now I decide to be a plumber. And I, fine, I'll have the credibility of being a plumber because, well, nobody ever knew I was an architect. When you become famous, you don't go back to being anonymous. And that was my biggest fear of it all because we got signed when I was 31. Sure, at 18, I even did the, the equivalent of The Voice in France, which was then called the Star Academy. So sure, you dreamed of it all, and but you didn't really know what it was. Then I became friends with people who are mega famous, like Elton Bono and others. And you realize, wow, do I really want to go to Vegas and crossing from the, the performance to the restaurant, having to stop 15 times because somebody wants a picture, somebody wants an autograph, another one wants a picture, another one has a story to tell me. And by the time we got signed, I didn't really want that. I felt that my, the biggest luxury I had was my freedom. So... Nick Raphael was very convincing and we found a business formula that would allow me to follow back on my feet if it didn't work. And that's how, that's how the story was. So to answer your question and sorry for the long end, but there's a no, behind no, it. All. By the time we got signed, I personally was like, it's an unbelievable. It's a miracle. I was busking to pay my legal studies. I ended up being signed by Universal. Wow. But realistically, am I ready for it? Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Well, I mean, the, the album is still incredibly successful, uh, in, especially uh, what a, what a great thing to to do Marrakesh Express with Graham Nash. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's that was a good trick, and then uh, we did the Ventura Highway of America with the the two guys left of with America. America and Booker T as well, and Booker T on, on yeah, absolutely. I mean, see, that's just is- wicked. That's when magic happens, because we, we were going to record an album, and then Larry said, you know, we could do, since you guys are going to do Venture Highway, why don't we do it with America? And I said, really? And I, you know, America, when I discovered music, maybe when I was 14, I was listening to Horse With No Name, Venture Highway. That's how he got to be part of the repertoire, because I said, well, this is, this is a, you know, beautiful, beautiful harmonies in it. So good. Yeah. I mean, so th- th- this is magic, and now we're doing the same again. So we are doing, we did uh, something good with Peter Noon of Herman's Hermit. And we wow. have another song that we're going to do with another big name. I cannot say yet who it is because nothing is signed. We agreed on everything. I'm waiting for the contract, which is being written by uh, the legal team. But the, this, this new, new singles and possibly album are going to be in the same idea. There's going to be a lot of guest appearances. And those are the people who made the songs famous back in the day wow I, I, I can't can't even imagine who that will be but i know it will be huge and and, and brilliant so i mean we mentioned america there uh wanted to talk about some other favorites uh you know favorite artists of yours um the mm. beach boys of course you guys do great harmonies uh, when did you discover the beach boys so i was Again, I was probably 14 when I discovered the Beach Boys and it was I was a gymnast and I was training at gymnastics and our teacher had put together a group of gymnasts that would do a little show for the end end of year. You know, you would close the year and there would be a gala night at the gym and stuff. And he addressed all his friends and himself with, you know, surfer vibe and the music that they would do the show and the flips and things on was uh, I Get Around of the Beach Boys. Wow. That's how I discovered wow. the Beach Boys. And I heard that and I thought, wow, who the hell did these harmonies? Turns out it's Brian Wilson and he did everything. And it turns out he's deaf of one year. So I thought that was pure genius because he probably heard the things in his brain louder than in his ears at that point. And, and that's how... I, I felt it was magic. And then, of course, I listened to the albums. And then I, uh, and then you hear it with headphones as technology, you know, evolved. And the headphones became better and better. And, and now you really can hear a lot of beautiful things of the Beach Boys. So it keeps growing into me even today because now with technology, we can listen to even a wider range of the harmonies. It's quite incredible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the harmonies are just... And it's very difficult to pull to pull those off you know do you find uh doing beach boys uh covers difficult because they are like considered to be you know really really hard to attempt quite intricate 
very good question. It's actually very hard. So right now, uh, because I am where I am, and because I'm training a new team, um, I am recording every song with every part, with you know little local microphone, nothing big, not, not, not a professional studio, but so that I can send it to the new team and they can learn them. And when we meet, they are ready. And one of the things I was doing uh, lately was uh, California Girls of the Beach Boys. Wow. Man, it's hard. It's impossible. So it's, you know, you can figure out in music theory, you can figure out what should be done. But what you cannot figure out is what Brian Wilson heard in his mind and made the brothers do. So I am sure that if you individually isolated each one of the harmonies that they do, there's probably a few things that shouldn't be there harmonically. In music theory, they shouldn't be there. But they are certainly there and they might be making the magic. So yes, it's extremely hard. And you don't want to go out and do a Beach Boys song and make it sound like another band or a bad version. Yeah. But we're getting there. We, 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 we got, uh, I get around pretty well. Uh, we used to do good vibrations. Wow. We've done, yeah, we've done a few. Uh, uh, there was another one that Anders used to sing. I forgot. But anyway, we, 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 we get there. But California Girls is definitely a tough one. Yeah, I mean, all of those seem really, really difficult. Uh, you also mentioned Lulu. Um, what made you a big fan of Lulu? Or what makes you a big fan? Um, when I was starting to play and practice with Phil, who co-founded the band with me, one night, <clears throat> he had a beautiful apartment overlooking the old town of Nice. And we were out there on the setting, and it's all the roofs uh, of, of, of the old town of Nice that we would look at. And he said, I just want to hear this song. He pulled out a cassette player. We had cassettes then. Mm -hmm. And and it was Oh Me Oh My of Lulu. And I thought, you know, it's, it's major seven. Ooh, to make you laugh. I'll play the fool for you. And I thought, wow, how it, it reminded me of classical music that I had studied a bit. Impressionism. Nothing was, you know, it's not, it's not major. It's more of a suggestion of a moment. And I thought, seventh. wow. Yeah, major seventh. I thought, wow, what a beautiful combination to have a verse, which is a bit light, and then when it's a chorus, the chords are, are majors. And I thought that was beautiful. And then I found out all about Lulu. And sure enough, I had heard Lulu without knowing I had heard Lulu because I didn't know who it was. I was 18 then. I didn't know who it was that did uh, shout and and uh, to serve with love. And then I read about Lulu and she's from Scotland. And I thought, wow, good for her. And I <laughs> fell in love with her. And then yeah. I met her. I just, oh, yeah, I forgot to say, I met her. We wow. were... It was an Elton John's party in Nice, actually, once again at La Petite Maison. He was there, and I think they asked us to, David must have told me, hey, we're going there, and by any chance you're playing, we're with a few musicians' friends. And Lulu was there, and we rocked it. And then at the end, Elton says, did you take off your shirt? So I did, in the middle of the restaurant. And <laughs> Lulu came and took a picture with me, uh, with my shirt off. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It was crazy. Yeah, that, I mean, that restaurant... Uh is do you guys go back there and play often when we can we do but obviously right now everything is closed uh, yeah of course and i, I want to come on to how how that's how that's affected things um the uh, the next artist uh, well you highlighted a song actually unforgettable nat king cole why the, yeah, why I, that why that song in particular i mean it is a beautiful song by an incredible uh, artist uh but first of all, it's a beautiful song by an incredible artist. Secondly, I, f I think a song can make a moment unforgettable. And, it, and there's a very powerful feeling in that. And, you know, sometimes human vocabulary might not have enough words to describe a certain feeling you have. But I have the impression that music always nails it. So you listen to a song and it maybe generates an emotion, that song will always and exactly correspond to that emotion that was developed. So when I heard for the first time, Unforgettable, the lyrics, the combination of the chords and how Nat King Cole sings it or sang it, I just thought it was perfection. You listen to that, either alone even, and you think of someone and you have someone in your mind that was unforgettable. 
maybe, and in my case, that was the story actually. It's someone I only met one night. It was in Cannes uh, during the Cannes Festival. And uh, her name is Veronica Martinez. I've never seen her since. I've looked for her on social media and everywhere, and I've never seen her since. We had, there was magic. We, 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 we fell in love instantly, and I never saw her again. So, of course, she was going back to Mexico. She was Mexican the next day. And obviously, she thought, what am I thinking? You know, the guys in the south of France is a street musician. No chance. <laughs> and the moment made her unforgettable. So I don't necessarily, I cannot necessarily explain with words the feeling that happened that night. It was not sexual. It was emotional. It was alchemical. It was, it was pure magic. I don't know. Everything was perfect. And there was the stars and the night was warm and he made an unforgettable moment. So if I listen to Unforgettable, I know exactly the feeling it generates in me. And there's no other song that will generate that feeling. Another song might generate another feeling. But that, that for me is, a, is, a, is an extremely strong song. And I think that's how we get to like songs because they often represent our match with an emotion we've had. Yeah, no, no, that's a very very true you know songs are ultimately about the connections that we make to them uh, about what emotions they evoke in us and uh well hopefully you know veronica is a fan of the greatest music of all time podcast uh based in mexico you know maybe a reunion will be on the cards uh but but yeah, what, what an amazing story i, I think it's unlikely but <laughs> but uh what an amazing know, story you know. I have found people that I hadn't, haven't seen for 20 years in South Africa when I was there for a day and a half. And they were like, wow. Didi. And I turned around like, what are you doing here? Somebody from my hometown in Italy, which has 2,000 inhabitants. <laughs> so you never know. Let's hope that Veronica one day, she, she, know, she might land on it. Um, people land on our songs often by, by chance. Right now, I'm, as I said, I'm in San Barthélemy. There's an Italian restaurant and they were playing our music and I got to go there quite a lot and they didn't know it was it was us. So it was wow. funny that you enter a restaurant, your own music is playing. And I, I made the joke. I said, you're playing some great music. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, do you want me to ask the manager who it is? So joking, I said, yeah, please, uh, could, you, could you ask who it is? And uh, and they came back and they said, it's the Gypsy Queens and the song is Italiano. I said, wow, this is truly beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so we wrote it down and, uh, and they said, do you know them? And I said, no. No, 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 but great choice. Thank you. And then, of course, they found out that it was me. So they texted the, <laughs> the manager texted and said, son of a gun, you come in anytime you want. We'll play your music. <laughs> it's a good tactic, though. You know, make sure they keep it playing. Don't, well, reveal, yeah, your, you don't reveal your identity and, you know, just say, oh, I really think you should be playing this music all the time. I can tell everybody in the restaurant is really enjoying it. <laughs> that's the trick when they don't look who it is or whatever I, I off, when it happens in a few other occasions it's not very common that it happens to us you know we're not the Rolling Stones we're not whatever but still it happens I generally don't say anything or, other than asking who is this great music I don't want anybody to know it's me but you know oh somebody said it was great music we'll keep playing it <laughs> and, and so I mean as someone who's come up a lot I'm a big fan of Elton John uh, mm -hmm. you know so you mentioned him as one of your favourite artists um, obviously, he's also done quite a lot to help you personally, uh, it sounds like anyway. Absolutely. So first of all, when I actually, uh, Elton has seen us perform, had seen us perform three times before I had ever seen Elton perform, which is a bit of a, <laughs> wow, who would think that? Uh, secondly, when I saw Elton for the first time, he was doing Red Piano in Vegas. So I went to Vegas and saw him do Red Piano. And I thought that is that is a performance because, you know, some other people or maybe without going big celebrities, but some people are just sat there playing and nothing happens and they just deliver the song and Elton performs his song and he's been performing them for how many years and he still gives them the same energy, the same punch and everybody goes crazy. And I thought, OK, that's a performance. So I thought it was amazing. Eventually, we, be, we became friends, and he did do a lot for us. And, and, you know, he never wanted anything in any possible way. He was just happy for, I like you guys. You go and succeed. Here's what I can do to help you. And he always did. In fact, it's uh, thanks to David and Elton that I recently uh, 
got in touch with someone who is the person I cannot tell you who it is yet, but who will be our, not our next single, but the third single of this hopefully album. And it's thanks to them that, uh, that I was in touch with her. I can say it's a female. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like they've been, you know, incredibly helpful and, uh, and, and, you know, as a live performer, I think he is the, you know, the, the greatest out there for sure. Uh, I've seen him live many times and uh, I think I think it is just you know to keep going for that long and to play a live so often I mean I know Bob Dylan plays live a lot as well but he doesn't really sound like his records Um, Mm. and I know Elton's voice has changed but you know they're just so solid and they've kept going 100 gig hundreds of gigs every year you know like it is nuts you compare them to the stones the stones only go out a few few gigs every now and again which is still amazing at their age but to keep up that schedule you know I think that's an inspiration to all of us Um, I wanted to ask you about you know obviously this time the era of coronavirus is really really challenging to keep up motivation if you survive off live performances but you know it's 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 really uh, such a challenging time how have you found it and what is your opinion on how governments have dealt with it particularly with regards to, you know, how much they've prioritized live performance and what are your hopes for the future as well? So um, for us, it's been going from literally 200 performances a year to almost zero. Some people in summer wanted us to play. We did. And I thought I was against it, but I asked the band if they wanted, and obviously they wanted it because, uh, you know, we have to keep surviving and making money. So we did a few and I thought, okay, we'll do those that are outside, you know, in somebody's garden, et cetera, which we did. So we respected social distancing at least 99% of the time. It would be <clears throat> the guests who wouldn't and I would have to pull back. Anyway, it was very hard. And uh, it's what is hard is it's also a constant training to perform. So when you will go back, you, you got to sort of retrain yourself and repractice to, to get back to playing together you know in 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 symbiosis with a band so it's been a bit of a massacre and i suppose it's been a massacre for any live musician because so many live performances have been stopped even more so for us because we we sell our personal attention to your private party more than anything else obviously 99 percent of our business is private parties we do harrogate once a year as a festival and that's about our only public performance and when you are playing acoustic to someone you get to have you you get to be very close to them so obviously a virus makes you not being able to do it and often we have to be very loud because the party goes crazy so you have to shout so you project a lot of air that will obviously transmit the virus so all that was stopped for us and um and it was it was a massacre um for the second part of your question i think it's always easy to say they should do that, government should do this, government should do that. The one thing I think is, is my firm opinion is that, especially in France, they have let the population guide itself a lot. In other words, you are confined, but you can write yourself a letter that says you have an important thing to do, like a professional reason, et cetera, and it allows you to go wherever you want. The problem is populations have, less and less populations have been to the army. I haven't been to the army uh, out of choice. And I noticed that older generations, I have a friend in New York whose name is Terry Moran. He was a Marine. He respects authority. He respects rules. There is a national anthem. He stands up. And that sort of is a respect for something that is what unites us all, which, which is a constitution and a territory. And I find that because the army is not mandatory anymore in many countries, populations often lose the feeling of this is a common effort. They lose the feeling of hierarchy and the feeling of authority. They see it more as a punishment, certainly in France, than than as what we need to do to get this virus over until there is a vaccine. Now it seems to go towards the vaccine. So I think that the mistake that I would consider that was made is primarily thinking the population is going to not party, not get together and let them sort of do a little too much. 
especially in France, when you see that there is a party with 2,000 people for New Year's Eve, a clandestine party, and we wow. never heard of it again. There was. And what happened wow. to the organizers? Did we ever hear that they got taken to jail? If you think of what it really means, it means that those young kids who were there, they maybe see the grandparents the next week, they possibly have killed them. So it's a murder in the end. So I'm getting a bit <laughs> sidetracked now, but what I want to focus on is that it's easy to say this should have been done. I think that the general psychology of governments could have been we need to be a little more authoritarian in this case until there is a vaccine. And now regarding the vaccine and what's happening, well, France, it doesn't have the vaccine because someone else bought it first or they were not delivered. It's a cacophony again. Seriously, this is what might get us out. Elton was promoting, uh, Elton John was, Sir Elton John, sorry, was uh, very much promoting getting vaccine. Um, uh, and I agree with him that it is the solution to get back to some form of normality. The antithesis to that, and this is where I am not, as, not scientific enough, is what does the vaccine really do? I, I never heard of a vaccine that is built in two years. Now, possibly because there was SRAS seeds of the virus before, the vaccine was developed faster because it was 10 years. It, this was coming and people were prepared or companies were prepared. I don't know. But I am respecting very much, even here in saint Bart, where it's a little more relaxed uh, because the cases were or are low, very low. Uh, but I am respecting all that. So... I want to see for a few months what does the vaccine really do if I can. I will not go anywhere. I won't do anything. I'd rather be patient and respect the authorities and then see what the vaccine does maybe for another few weeks or a month or two. And when we find out that everybody that has a vaccine is up and running and there's no real consequences, absolutely, I will get vaccine. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, do you envisage that you will be back for some sort of normality by the end of the year? Do you think you might be playing by then? So. I, I think so. We actually have bookings for May and uh, I have a booking for April in Mexico. Once again, yeah. it's outdoor. It's, it's people who are, you know, they're very careful. So they are in themselves keeping a, month, uh, a meter apart and we will be a lot more background than as we normally go, jump on chairs and get everybody crazy. But under those terms, okay, fine. And I actually have performed with a mask one night uh, to see if it was possible, and it's absolutely possible. So, you know, uh, it's not hard to respect those so that we do get back to normality eventually. I think that by the end of the year, we should be back at normality. But I also think that the normality will have changed. In other words, it might be that we need to show that we have been vaccine to travel. It, it, it certainly looks like it's leaning that way. It might be, and maybe that's not a bad thing. After all, if this is something that I can give to you because I don't know I have it, well, then I shouldn't, you know? Would you willingly give me AIDS or, or no, you, you wouldn't do that. So I think that being passive about it is as negative as being active in the wrong way. So, so I think that if we get to go back to normal, it'll be by the end of the year and it might, the new normal might be a scrutiny, a severe scrutiny of, of your health condition which is not bad for human beings, after all. Mm, mm. Yeah, I mean, that, that's very possible. Do you think that the restrictions could continue, though, and rule out things like live music permanently? I mean, I think, I don't see that happening. I think people will be pretty quick to get back to normal if the vaccines prove to have worked, because people will lose their appetite. Do you think there'll be still a bit of an appetite, though, for some restrictions? You know, can you imagine masks becoming like a permanent facet of life or things like that social distancing or do you reckon it will all kind of go once the vaccines work i th i think at hope uh, the vaccine will definitely work and that we all go back to normality normality it mm. might not be normality like that because you might have to show your your health passport. tracking fine you, yeah basically but I, it's not natural to wear a mask it's not natural to worry before you hug someone it's not natural to keep meters away from each other, you yeah. know, and, and if you think of this, I'm 40 years old and I've luckily had a bit of a career and, and, you know, I have a life that I very much enjoyed so far. It must be even harder for those who are just starting. Imagine somebody had just created a band uh, a little more than a year and a half ago, they were starting to happen. And all of a sudden you cut the grass under their feet, no live performances, etc. 
it must be hard. So I cannot see not going back to normality. In fact, generally, in French as an expression, it'll come back like a boomerang. You know, you throw it and then it takes speed. And when it comes back, you catch it. But if it hits you, it hits you badly. So I think that eventually we'll go back to a normality, which will be filled with love, filled with hugs, filled with kisses, filled with serenity. And I certainly hope so. What this should do, it should, realize, it should make populations realize that we're all in this together, also concerning environment. And this could have been the consequences of human beings mistreating animals, for example, because in China especially, and I'm not pointing my finger at any, any parts, but you know, maybe respect towards animals in China is not as strong as it is in other places. I am no head of state, I am no diplomat, I am nothing. I am talking about observations uh, that I conclude of my travels. So I think that what this should do is uh, definitely ins incite us, excite us towards being a little more respectful of each other, being a little more respectful of, of the environment and therefore animals, which seems to be where the virus came from. And we should realize that we're all together. Forget about war country against country. How about a war that we all fight together for our survival in the end, which is the health of the planet? Forget the money resources and whatnot. How do, does human, you know, humanity continues? This should teach us that type of lesson, lesson, I think, and hope. But money is another subject. If you're enjoying the Greatest Music of All Time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.